Uh, before I get going, um, while I'm speaking, I'd like you to engage in a little exercise. I'd like you to take a typical day, could be today, and jot down what you think your carbon diary is. In other words, have a hazard a guess at the carbon in each and everything you do during the day. From the moment you get up, to what goes into your breakfast, to how you get to work, to what you do at work, and what you do with your leisure. Just have that in the back of your mind, and I'll come back to that right at the end of my uh, uh, 15 or 20 minutes. So, what I would like to do in the time that's available to me while you're uh, jotting down your carbon diary is to think really hard about what net zero really means. Not the hype and the nice headlines, but fundamentally what it would mean to be net zero. And in that context, I want to explore what a unilateral carbon policy looks like. Because that, after all, is what net zero is all about, and indeed what all the initiatives that you, uh, ESB and others, uh, are, are taking forward are engaged in. What is it that uh, comprises the argument that you should do stuff, even though Ireland is such a small part of the global warming picture, and to be blunt, what you do will make very little difference to global warming itself. So why should you act unilaterally as a country, and back to that carbon diary, personally? And I want to argue that carbon pricing, and particularly carbon border adjustments, are absolutely critical to any attempt to do this in an economically efficient way. And that's not just because I'm an economist, it's because if it's not done in an economically efficient way, the burden on the population will be substantive, and particularly to the poor and more vulnerable members of society. We have to find an efficient way to carry this out if we're going to do it unilaterally. And I want to throw into that mix something that's not discussed very much in climate change uh, discussions, which is that there are two halves to this problem. There's the stuff we put up there, and there's the stuff the natural environment takes back out. And natural sequestration, what natural capital does, is half, at least, of the problem. And while we're merrily pumping carbon into the atmosphere, we're also trashing our rainforests, our soils, our peat bogs, and so on. And these are utterly crucial parts of the climate change story. And then I'll come back to you and your carbon diaries at the end. So let me start with net zero. I'm not very good at modern technology. I did my thesis with a typewriter and uh, Tipex and carbon paper. So I'm going to ask a very uh, uh, crude way of doing this. How many people in this room think that at least by 250, Ireland should aspire to be net zero? Put your hand up. Right, that's nearly everybody. Okay, a few exceptions. Now let me tell you what net zero actually means. We in the UK, our Climate Change Committee has said that when we get to net zero in 250, we will no longer be causing climate change, any climate change. We'll be no longer making any contribution to global warming. Utter rubbish. We will, a lot unless, of course, we stop imports entirely. Carbon production as a net zero target is only part of the story. Oh, and by the way, just in case you think that you just project forward what you think current carbon production emissions look like in Ireland or the UK or elsewhere, remember how implausibly uh, um, set these numbers are. Where's the carbon loss from the soils? Where's the carbon loss from the peat? Where is the fact that the, the uh, English fens are blowing away gradually? Just an aside, at any reasonable carbon price, there'd be no agriculture in the British fens whatsoever because of the peat loss from carbon. 
So just be careful about the number that the baseline you have at the beginning is. But this measures production. And when the Climate Change Committee made their great announcement uh, uh, a few weeks ago, at the same time in the British news was the possible closure of British steel. Now, if you want to do net zero carbon production, you must be praying that British steel is going to close. Because of course, that reduces your emissions of carbon in the UK. Why not finish it off? Actually, just do Brexit. Close down the car industry, take out Grangemouth, the petrochemical plant. In fact, close down British industry entirely. We would achieve net zero. And we would significantly increase global warming because that steel would come from China with 60 to 70% coal production base. The petrochemicals would come from around the world. The fertilizer, the cement, the aluminium, all the stuff that underpins our modern economy would be imported from elsewhere at higher carbon intensities than we produce at the moment. So I hope you get my drift. Carbon production, and indeed we have been reducing carbon production in Europe, does not reduce climate change. And the deindustrialization of Europe, which has gone on since 1990, is part of the reasons why emissions in Europe have gone down, but global warming has gone up. If you want to do net zero, it's net zero carbon consumption. And that includes imports. It's what you do, it's what you consume, it's what industry produces from you, and it doesn't matter a damn whether it's produced in the UK, in Ireland, or in China, or in Indonesia. What matters is the net carbon effect of the consumption that you do. And that's why you have to be very, very careful that when you're really eager for net zero carbon production by 250, you are actually going to make things better. And if we look backwards over the last 30 years of all the efforts we've been making to reduce uh, the impacts of climate change, to mitigate climate change itself. There are some quite worrying characteristics. This chart is very familiar, I think, to most people, just to, it really emphasizes the point that, that David King was making. These are extraordinary times we're in. There isn't anything over the last 800,000 years which looks anything like what we're doing. In that sense, the notion of extinction rebellion and climate crisis is correct. It is extraordinary. But the one graph that I find most troubling is this. In the last 30 years since 1990, there isn't a single blip in the increase of carbon concentration in the atmosphere. It goes up at now over two parts per million per annum. You can't even find the global financial crisis in there and the collapse of the Irish banks and the collapse of the financial systems in the US and in Europe. It just goes on remorselessly. This 30 years that we've had fighting climate change has in fact not just been 30 wasted years, it's been the greatest 30 years the fossil fuel industries have ever had. And it's really worth bearing that in mind this is the great glorious age since 1990 of the oil, gas, and coal industries. And behind all of that lies the enormous growth of China. It used to export coal at the end of the 1990s. It's now more than half the total world coal trade. If you look at the sorts of numbers that lie behind what's happened in the last 30 years, it should give you pause for thought. And it should particularly give you pause for thought about whether we should rely on Kyoto and now Paris to do the job. George Orr, yes, great. But is it going to actually overcome the free rider problem? Is it actually going to deal with the scale of the problems we confront? Is top-down going to work? And my answer is, might be helpful, but we have to confront the fact that at 6 to 8% GDP growth per annum, China, India, and Africa double the economic size every 10 years. So by 2030, there'll be two Chinas, not one, two Indias, not one, and two Africas. Oh, and Indonesia, Brazil, and all the other countries thrown in. And by 240, there'll be four Chinas, 
four Africas and four Indias. That is an enormous wall of consumption. And it comes back to my central point. It's about decarbonizing consumption, not just of affluent European countries, but of countries where uh, people are coming out of poverty and aspire to the kinds of living standards we have. So if you think that what Kyoto has done has made any difference at all to climate change, tell me where in the numbers you can detect that. And on the Paris front, we're nearly five years down the track. And what is the outcome? A series of pledges which don't add up to two degrees. Nobody's doing very much. And of course, 1.5 on top of it, we're way off course. So the question is, if that is not going to do the, 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 the job, maybe very useful, maybe helpful, maybe a good thing to pursue, what else is? And this is where we fall back to unilateralism. We've got to do it ourselves. And why? Well, there are lots of different reasons put forward. The most important one is the moral one. It's your ethical duty not to make climate change worse, even if other people are. Just like it's your ethical duty not to steal, rob, murder, etc., just because other people might be doing so. It's a deep moral commitment, and that's what the young Extinction Rebellion and others are tapping into. It is also about leadership, but you have to be very careful about bringing forward exemplars. They actually have to work. They have to show how to do it and how to do it efficiently. No good doing the energy vendor, closing your nuclear power stations and building 13 gigawatts of new coal and not bothering to close the rest of your dirty coal industry until 238. That isn't a good exemplar. Germany has demonstrated what you shouldn't do if you want to tackle climate change. We need something better, more enlightened, more directed. And we need to take into account in the process, not just the climate, but the extinction of species, our biodiversity, our natural capital, and our natural environment, where there are enormous opportunities. So unilateralism is the game in town, but you need to do it properly. And you need to do it with a view to your carbon consumption, not your carbon production. The most efficient tool in all of this is a carbon price, a uniform carbon price. To date, climate change has been a wonderful home for lobbyists, campaigning for subsidies for their own particular technologies. And we have ended up in Europe with some of the most expensive things being done first, while leaving low-hanging fruit sitting out there and not harvested. Take agriculture. In the UK, agriculture is 0.7% of GDP, less than the additions to the ONS numbers for the national accounts of the illegal sex and drugs industry. It's trivial. That's not to belittle what farmers do. It's incredibly important what farmers do. But it's very small. And of the 9 billion it produces, this is the UK numbers, 3 billion is direct subsidy. It has cheap diesel, red diesel, so subsidized carbon consumption. It doesn't pay for the pesticides, the nitrates, the fertilizer runoffs, etc. Oh, and we don't have inheritance tax for farmers. Uh, we don't have business rates, etc. The net economic output is low. And yet, farmers in the UK cover 70% of the land area, and the soils are by far the most important carbon sink we've got. With peat together, four times more important than the atmosphere. And the way we treat the soils, the way we sequestrate the carbon, the way in which we plant trees, etc., these are cheap, low-hanging fruit, and we haven't done anything about them at all. Instead, we've concentrated on some of the most expensive renewables technologies first. And as an aside, it's not true that offshore wind is grid competitive or cost competitive, and that's because it's not equivalent firm power. Once you add the full cost intermittency onto a system, we've still got quite a long way to go. That's not to say the cost reductions aren't fantastic and really good news, but this idea, oh, it's all subsidy free now. Well, great. Get outside Parliament. No subsidies for renewables. 
banish them now, abolish subsidies now. If that's what you believe, that you think it's cost competitive, you don't need any subsidies. And of course you do. It's vital those subsidies are there because we are not on a level playing field yet for the renewables. We'll get there, but not quite yet. We need the support. So we need to have a uniform carbon price which allows people to search for the most cost-effective ways of finding emissions reductions. And we need to think quite hard about how we normalize renewables into the electricity system, and that's essentially equivalent firm power auctions. Uh, and of course, the carbon price must apply at the borders to imports as well as home production. That makes it carbon consumption-based net zero, not carbon production. Now, I just wanted to mention quickly before uh, coming back to you and your personal responsibilities, um, natural sequestration. So there's a lot of talk, rightly, about how the hell we get the carbon back out of the atmosphere um, uh, and bury it in some form or other because it's not clear that we're going to decarbonize uh, the generation of those emissions fast enough. And all the focus goes on CCS. And that's what I call industrial sequestration. Piping the stuff into holes in the ground, storing it in those holes in the ground, monitoring them, etc., having first separated it. But the other side of sequestration is the environment does it for us all the time. Our planet would not be habitable but for the sequestration by the oceans, by the great rainforests, by the soils, by the peat bogs, etc. And these turn out to be often much, much cheaper options than the options of industrial sequestration. I'm not saying we shouldn't do industrial sequestration, but on a par, we should think very clearly about our land. And think how much better you can use the land than we use it at the moment. Think how modern agriculture has abused our landscape. Think of the biodiversity. Think of the mental, physical, recreational, other benefits from benignly looking to sequestrate soil in our, uh, carbon in our soils to planting the right kinds of trees in the right kind of places to making it possible for our natural environment to be green and prosperous, to use the title of my recent book, as well as carbon sequestrating. Net zero and agriculture should meet up and have a pretty good marriage pretty quickly and indeed celebrate it in Irish fashion as well. Which brings me finally to personal responsibilities. It's a great illusion, and it's particularly an illusion of all those people demonstrating, that, you know, the cause of climate change is those ghastly corporates those fat cat executives who sit in these international companies and don't give a damn about the environment and the climate. It's nice and convenient, and they can pay for it too. The trouble is, it's just not true. All the production that takes place in the world's economy is for us. It is us that do the carbon consuming. It's us that live in the houses. It's us that need the steel. It's us that buy the food off the... Uh, supermarket made from fertilizers uh, from the Harbour Bosch process with loads of CO2 emissions, with the pesticides, the nitrates, etc., etc. It's us that uses the transport. It's us that goes on personal holidays. And therefore, it's us that ultimately the cause and therefore the solutions to climate change lie with. That's why I'd like you to keep a carbon diary, because what you'll observe is two things. One is just how remarkably carbon percolates almost every aspect of your life. That's how we got from 2 billion people at the beginning of the 20th century to 7 billion people. It's a carbon century. So first of all, realize that, but also realize the huge opportunities to improve one's own life by being lower carbon, by walking, by cycling, by taking those holidays here, not abroad, by doing a whole variety of things, buying local products, all those small little steps that enable you at least to say that you personally have accepted the moral responsibility that you are not causing any more global warming. And of course, if we have a carbon tax with a carbon border adjustment, that's actually the best way of getting back to the top-down solution. If you're a Chinese exporter, 
and, they, and you have to pay a carbon tax at the border coming into Dublin port to the Irish government. But instead, you could have a carbon tax at home, keep the money for yourselves, and therefore have an exemption from the carbon tax coming in because you've already priced carbon. What are you going to do? You're going to be encouraged to go down your own carbon tax as well. A domestic carbon tax with a border adjustment, a target focused on net carbon uh, consumption zero, and a personal responsibility, and a better and more healthy natural environment doing the sequestration, all part of the upsides of addressing climate change, as well, of course, of splitting out the light spectrum, doing solar film, and doing all the exciting things that the electricity industry is going to have to do because we're going to be in a digital world which will be electric and therefore require that electric um, uh, power to uh, be the backbone of our economies going forward. So keep a personal diary, remember why unilateralism matters, and then think through one's own moral responsibilities for that personal transition. Thank you very much. Thank you.